Since it is spring break, um, I thought we'd start with a few jokes, right? And unfortunately, I, w- I didn't get the memo from Anna, and so um, she already started things off, and so now I have to follow her. So uh, bear a couple things in mind. One, I have to follow Anna. Uh, two, I'm a dad, so there's a bit of dad joke uh, humor in here. And three, I have several jokes. So the first couple are just primers, okay? So like we're easing into this for everyone. Um, so first joke, and as a, I should note one more thing, um, we're entering into Philippians chapter 2, uh, and there's this huge, amazingly beautiful scripture passage in uh, verses 5 through 11 talking about the humility of Christ. So we're kind of going to uh, land on the humility humor here with the joke. So first joke, uh, why was the cannibal lion so humble? Because he swallowed his pride. Come on. Yeah, okay. There we go. All right. It gets better. It gets better. Uh, Why is there no such thing as a humble train engineer? A humble train engineer. Because those cocky guys are always tooting their own horn. (laughs) Okay, okay. Those are the easy ones. Then we get into the good one. This is a story about a farmer. Uh, And this farmer moved across the nation. And it says, after getting settled in the new town... A farmer went to church for the first time. He found that the people in the church gossiped and shunned him for his poor appearance. After the service, the preacher went to the farmer and told him that, in this town, we get dressed up for church. The farmer replied, but I'm just a farmer with no better clothes than these. What shall I do? Pray to God, the priest replied. He will tell you what to do. The next week, the farmer came back to church wearing different clothes, but they were no better than the other set of clothes he had on before. The priest interrupted the service to berate the farmer. He said, didn't I tell you to ask God what to wear to come to church? Yes, sir, you did. And did you do that? Well, yes, sir, I did. And what did God tell you? The farmer thought, and he said, well, to be honest, Father, he didn't know. He said he'd never been in this church before. (laughs) Burn. All right. So, uh, we spent the last six weeks in our series in Philippians. Uh, We've gotten through chapter one in those six weeks, so we're really moving along. Today we enter into chapter two. As I said, this portion on the humility of Christ is such a fantastic verse to spend some time in together. Um, But we're going to break this passage kind of into two parts. One through four is really a continuation from chapter one, so we're kind of going to wrap that up. But it also transitions us into uh, verses five through eleven. And so let me say a prayer for us, and we'll dive into the first uh, four verses of Philippians chapter 2. Father, we are so thankful for the time to be together, Lord, for the time to grow in your word, Lord, for the time that you, um, you have to speak into our lives and hearts, God. Um, and so as you do, and as your word does, Lord, we pray that you would speak specifically um, into our life, into our circumstances, into the areas, Lord, where we need you most where we need your encouragement, where we need your conviction, where we need our faith stretched and deepened. And so, Lord, in this time, we ask that you would do that work. Thank you for being with us. Um, Thank you for your goodness. It's in your name. Amen. Amen. Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. If you have a Bible, you can open with us there. Uh, And if you don't, we'll have the passage on the screen. Chapter 1, or sorry, chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, if any of you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being in one spirit and one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. As we mentioned, Paul's continuing uh, his encouragement for unity. But where we saw at the end of chapter one is he was referring to unity in the midst of outside pressure. He kind of transitions into unity in the middle of possible internal division, right? Uh, He launches into these four if statements, which is really just a leading uh, way of framing a because statement, right? He could have easily said, Because you have encouragement, because you have comfort, uh, because you have common sharing in the spirit, because of the tenderness and compassion, 
But he uses if, right? And those if statements are meant to make you pause and rather than just telling what you have, acknowledge for yourself the things that you have in relationship with the Lord and in community with his people. Um, some of you parents, right, who have kids, um, I've heard that some of you with kids, uh, your kids tend to squabble and fight. I've never experienced that myself. But um, if you have kids, if you're around kids, even if you're <laughs> around adults, right, if you don't have kids that fight, you might have those friends who just love to push each other's buttons. Like, it gives one of them just sheer joy to cause torment to the other person. But you can think of whether it be kids, friends, family members who just always seem to be in those quarrels together. One of the most helpful things we can do in those moments is not simply just tell them why they shouldn't be in a fight, but remind them and help them come to the place of acknowledging for themselves, man, what a blessing they have with that other person. What a blessing they have in that relationship. For us, I would say commonly with our, we have twin boys who are seven, Isaac and Asher. Um, they do everything together. They love being together. They're always laughing together. They are always wrestling together. They're always making up games together. They never want to be apart. But with two of them, and often only one thing or one place or whatever the one is, right, there comes, there comes some tension, some squabbling over the thing. And I think one of the most helpful things as parents we can do is not just tell them, oh, you shouldn't fight, but Isaac, if you want to play with your brother, man, you have to share. You have to be generous with the things you have, right? Because all I need to do is remind Isaac of the fact that how much fun do you have with your brother, right? In, in a clear mindset, he could, he could know, oh, I love being with my brother. It's clear because I never want to be apart from him. But in those moments... Man, just a simple reminder, if you want to enjoy this time with your brother, if you want to play together, if you want to do that game, then what, what does it require of you for your own actions and your own response to them? And these if statements are meant to bring us to a place of acknowledging the blessing that we have. Within these four statements, Paul is reiterating some key pieces of the Christian life right off the bat, right? He says, if, <laughs> if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ. Other versions would say belong to Christ, right? Again, coming back to this place of your identity within the family of God and your identity in Christ. He says, if you have comfort of knowing you are God's and loved by God. He says, if you have any common sharing in the spirit, right? This theme of partnership and community we have together. And lastly, the fourth one, he says, if any tenderness and compassion, right? Not only that you have community with one another, but that there is a sense of tenderness, compassion. In verse uh, 8 of chapter 1, Paul said, affections of Christ for one another. Which I just need to know, I don't know if you've heard this statement before, but for me, coming to know the Lord right before, well, end of middle school, kind of getting my foundation of what it meant to be a believer in high school and college, there was this phrase that was often used, and it talked about like when you don't get along with another believer. And this was the phrase, right? Uh, you don't have to like them, but you have to love them. Man, I just want to say that's such baloney. <laughs> like, right? The idea is like, oh, well, you got to love them because it's the Christian thing, but you don't have to care or like or enjoy being around them. Man, what a, what a waste. Like, what we see throughout the scriptures is that, man, if our hearts are right before the Lord and our hearts are right with one another, what that produces is a tenderness and a joy and a desire to actually want to be together as the family of God. So rather than just dismissing those divisions or challenges or conflict that we have one another, those are points where we need to check our own heart before the Lord. Why don't I have affection or tenderness or compassion for my brother or sister in Christ? Here suggests that that should be the normal, the, the normal Christian life with one another. Again, uh, you parents who, again, have kids who are always fighting, how much joy, joy do you get when you see them playing well together? having laughter together and peace together, right? Paul's almost talking from like a paternal standpoint here of, as a father when he says, man, right here, then make my joy complete by being like-minded and having the same love, being in one spirit and of one mind, right? That another source of joy for the Christian and in the Christian life is unity within the family of God. You parents whose kids are getting along, how much joy does that bring you when you experience those awesome moments when there just is peace. Perhaps the key word there is moments <laughs> when your kids have peace with one another. 
And this, this relational peace that he's referring to, this is, this is a peace of shalom, right? This word for peace used throughout the scriptures. This idea of holistic peace, right? In this sense, talking about that, man, when we have peace with one another in the presence of God, there is something in our hearts that cries and resonates with this is the way life was intended to be. It, it is a cry to a new heaven and new earth when one day when Christ returns and makes all things new, we'll have continuous, constant peace with one another in the presence of God. Our hearts recognize it. Our hearts long for it. And our hearts take joy in it when we get those experiences here on earth. But on this side of eternity, uh, that peace and unity often get interrupted. That peace and unity is something that takes a lot of energy to fight for and to make in the midst of the situations we face. I would say this is why Paul, in every single one of his letters, makes an appeal to unity. You cannot read a letter in the New Testament where Paul doesn't have to address, man, seek one heart, one mind, one faith with one spirit. Put aside the things that would cause division among you. Because the reality is, there will be points of division and conflict. In this passage, Paul addresses head-on some of those causes, those things that would attack unity, those things which would erode peace in our community. Verse 3, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. It's interesting to note that vain conceit, literally it would be translated as empty glory or false glory. Glory without substance. Right, the, the idea and where it's often used in scripture is referring to selfish ambition and personal promotion. The things that we believe, man, if I do this, if I accomplish this, if I make it here, then there will be something of my life that in fact is empty because there's no eternal weight or eternal permanence to that kind of glory. And instead, those things are actually what would erode peace and unity among us. Paul has experienced this firsthand, right? The, the effect of vain conceit and selfish ambition. If we flip back just a few verses, Philippians 1.17 Paul said, some preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. He speaks again at the end of Philippians in chapter 4, verse 2. And he's speaking to, to two women in the church who were the best we know, leader, like main leaders, core leaders within the church who now are having some division among them. And he says, I plead with you, Euodia, and I plead with you, Sintuhe, to be of the same mind in the Lord. Right, like no one is immune to <laughs> the effect that selfish ambition and vain conceit can cause in the middle of our relationships. And Paul is warning them, men, that will always, always, always bring ruin to community. You can't have those and avoid the destruction that those things will bring in your life. In the very next, next uh, sentence, Paul identifies the remedy, right? The remedy for selfish ambition and vain conceit. He says, rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Real easy. Got that. No problem. He says, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. Now, this is probably somewhat countercultural in our society today, but man, this was extremely countercultural to a Roman mindset and a Roman society. The, the, humili the virtue of humility didn't exist at this time, right? The, the highest virtue in a Roman society was glory and power. Humility would have been an, a complete opposite, antithesis of humility and power. So Paul, Paul is appealing to these people and having to go completely against what everything around them told them was the things they should pursue in their life. He's telling them, man, the things of this kingdom the things that the world around you would pursue often will be in complete opposition to the things of Christ and his kingdom, right? So which kingdom are you being a part of by the way you live and act and respond? I really appreciate the uh, description of a humble person that C.S. Lewis paints for us. In describing a humble person, C.S. Lewis says, do not imagine that if you meet a really humble man he will be what most people call humble nowadays. He will not be a sort of greasy, smarmy person. Side note, smarmy is a great word. 
Okay. Weekly, weekly vocabulary goal this week is use smarmy in a sentence once every day, okay? Right? If you can do that, come back and tell me. Um, he will not be a sort of greasy, smarmy person who is always telling you that, of course, he is a nobody. Probably all you will think about him is that he seemed a cheerful, intelligent chap who took a real interest in what you said to him. If you do dislike him, it will be because you feel a little envious of anyone who seems to enjoy life so easily. He will not be thinking about humility. He will not be thinking about himself at all. And maybe that's a common phrase we've heard about humility, right? Humility is not thinking of yourself less. It's thinking less of yourself, which I think is helpful. I think holistically, as you look at Scripture, this idea of humility is really just proper perspective. It's the perspective of realizing you're not in the center of the universe. There is one who is and one alone. Right? And anything that we are is because of what he has done on our behalf. That's a biblical perspective of what humility is and how we live it in our life. And as Paul uh, encourages them to, in humility, value others, I so appreciate that Paul was not the kind of guy who said, you know, do what I say, not what I do. Right? Paul was a preacher who practiced the things he preached. Again, just turning back a few verses in Philippians 1, 23 through 25, Paul is faced with a decision and some, some inner tension of what to do with where he's at in life. And he says, I am torn between the two. I desire to, be, to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. For me, it'd be much better just to go home with Jesus, is what he's saying. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. And convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. For their interest, for the interest of his church community, for the growth of their faith and the growth of their joy in the Lord, he was saying, I will put your, value, your interest above my own. Man, in our culture, it's so easy, right? Like our, our culture affirms and celebrates this attitude of self-promotion, of self-preservation. And the reality is it's not just our culture, right? It is our sinful nature, these things are deeply ingrained in fallen humanity. To put myself above everything and everyone around me. So what, what virtue takes precedence in our hearts and our lives, right? Following after the culture of Rome, the culture around us of personal power and glory, or <laughs> this crazy idea of personal humility at the sacrifice for the interests of others. John Stott says, at every stage of our Christian development and at every sphere of our Christian discipleship, pride is the greatest enemy and humility our greatest friend. In verse 5, Paul goes on to tell us where he gets this crazy idea. He says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God as something to be used for his own advantage, rather he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father." Man, again, this is where we're getting to this passage that is so rich. Right? This passage is considered like, like a, a wellspring of Christian doctrine and Christian living for 2,000 years. There is so much in this short passage, so in 15 to 20 minutes, we're just going to touch the surface. But I think it's important to know that these verses, 6 through 11, were a, a hymn or poetic creed used in early church liturgy. Right? And creed simply means a set of beliefs or principles to help guide one's life. And so what that meant is this was something consistently spoken over a community, consistently remembered and recited personally within one's life as a means to center one's life back on God. Right? The, the idea here is like a, a lighthouse giving directions to ships at sea so they don't lose course. And so in these five verses, we get a bit of a lighthouse of the Christian faith. Reminding us where the shore is, reminding of our true direction, reminding us where to go to come home. So Philippians, 
2, verse 5 and 6, as we start into this. It says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset or attitude as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God as something to be used to his own advantage. Some versions would say cling to or grasp onto. This word nature, that Jesus being in the very nature of God is the Greek morphe. It refers to the essential attributes, the, the inner nature, the essence of who someone is. In this passage, Paul is plainly saying, this Jesus that we're talking about, this Jesus is God, the pre-existent one, the one who's been there forever, <laughs> one of the trinity of the Godhead. John puts it this way in John 1. In the beginning was the Word, Jesus. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. Again, here in this time in history, this idea of Jesus being God was in such direct opposition to a Roman mindset. At this time, Romans were still practicing the uh, emperor worship, started with Caesar over 300 years earlier, that they actually promoted and propagated that the emperors were gods themselves, or at least sub-gods in their religion, right? And they did this simply as a means to manipulate their people, to bring obedience, to bring loyalty, so that their kings could expand their own kingdom and power and wealth. And then we see this Jesus declared to be God. And this Jesus is not like the kings of this world once again. Because see, our King Jesus did not use his divine right for his own advantage. Verse 7, rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. And there again is that word, morphe. And being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. He made himself nothing. Some versions would say he emptied himself. Here again, this Greek word is uh, kinu or kenosis, right? This is like a a big theological concept here. But simply put, it's this, again, this idea of emptying himself. And not that Jesus emptied himself of divinity, meaning he became less God to become man. He he was fully God and fully man, but rather he emptied himself by giving up his rights, his prerogative to act on his divine power. An example of this is uh, really easily seen, I think, in the temptation of Jesus, right? Jesus spends 40 days in the wilderness and he's spending time with the Father and then right after that, Satan comes and tries to tempt him. And as they're in the desert and Jesus hasn't eaten for 40 days, Satan's like, well, you're the son of God. Turn these rocks into bread, feed yourself. Right? Act on the divine power God has given you. But here again, Jesus humbles himself and does not fall prey to that. At his arrest in the garden, right, a mob comes to, to seize him to arrest him in Matthew 26. And Peter, being Peter, on Jesus' sword, he starts whacking people's ears off. Um, but what does Jesus say to him in verse 53? He says, don't you realize I could ask my father for a thousand of angels to protect us, and he would send them instantly. Again, in this moment, Jesus had all the power, but here, once again, he day by day was practicing this giving up of his right to act on that divine power for our sake, that he willingly gave himself up. He took on the very morphe, right? Took on the very form of the servant. Giving up his rights. And I think it's not only crazy that he does this, but it's crazy that in becoming man, he could have chosen any man. He, he, he could have chosen to be wealthy. He could have chosen to be in a noble family. He could have chosen to be a king. He could have chosen to be the emperor, the most powerful person on the planet at this time. But he didn't, did he? He chose humble beginnings. Born straw poor, living as a meager carpenter. He died a criminal's death on the cross, naked public disgrace. To Mark 10, 25 says, Christ here, speaking of himself, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, 
but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. I think John 13 gives us such a clear picture of this, right? In John 13, there's this scene of uh, Jesus washing his disciples' feet. The, the, the context for that is that as people, right, they come into a house as guests to share a meal together, and it was r- common practice, Jewish practice, to wash the feet of people before they sat down to eat their meal together. And there's a lot of reasons for that, but essentially that's what the practice was. And typically the person who was either lowest in the family or if the family had more wealth and maybe had servants, it was the lowest servant. Um, there's some texts that suggest for those households with servants or those households where maybe a, a kid or a servant needed some discipline, they'd be given this job. Like, you're not listening, go get some humility by cleaning the toilet, right? Like that's kind of the, the idea behind this job. And so as the disciples came in, you have to imagine they're kind of looking around waiting for someone to start this, this practice of washing feet and it's, it's not happening. So what are they going to do? Right? And I can just imagine in that moment, right? Peter looking around and Peter, of course, being Peter, being like, well, I'm the leader. It's not going to be my job. Matthew, of course, being like, well, I'm the smartest one here, so I'm not going to have to take this on. John uses the same old card he always uses. Well, Jesus loves me the best, so I don't have to do it. And as this is going on, as this scene is probably getting more and more awkward, what happens? Jesus takes out his outer garment, he puts a towel around his waist. One by one, he kneels down and washes each of their feet. Showing them, man, that humility is part of the very nature, the essence of who God is. As he completes it, he says, you call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done to you. The whole narrative of Scripture, all of God's actions towards humanity, all of the life that Christ displayed for us proclaims that he is a humble God before us. A God who created all things and yet humbled himself to the lowliest of deaths. A God who is eternal, who chose to die as a man. This idea is ridiculous. This idea makes no sense in a human framework. Especially in the Roman mindset, gods don't do that. At least not gods made by men. But the one true God, our Jesus, is a humble God. And we are called to live in humility because it reflects the very nature, the very essence of who God is. When we act in humility with one another and with the world, we're actually just carrying on the family trait, the family resemblance of who God is to the world around us. In Philippians 2, verse 9, it continues, Therefore, right, therefore, because Jesus humbled himself in this way, because he was obedient even to the point of death, it says, Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. And here again, if you, if you can put yourself in the Roman perspective, man, they just must be going crazy with these ideas that Paul's throwing at them. First, first he tells them that this God is humble, and that this man, Jesus, who they knew to be a man, is actually Lord They used the word curios, which was a title at this time reserved for the emperor. The only Lord was Nero in their mindset. So to say Jesus is Lord at this time was way more than just politically incorrect. Said in the wrong place, said before the wrong people, this could be imprisonment or murder and death. To call Jesus humble was foolishness. To call him Lord was rebellious. And yet, this is exactly who Jesus showed himself to be, a humble Lord. We heard a few things you said about his humility. This is what he said about his lordship in Matthew 28, 18. After he rose from the dead, he came, he said to his disciples, all authority, not some, not most, not almost all, 
all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. In Revelation 5, John, as he's getting a vision of things that will happen at the end of, <laughs> at the end of this world, at the end of time, he says, Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, Jesus, be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. Man, this idea of a, a humble God, a, a humble Lord, must have just seemed like an oxymoron, right, for, for someone growing up in a Roman culture, right? There, there's no place to put that in their mind or in a, in a sentence. And, and I think sometimes maybe even for us today, in the church today, this idea of a, a humble Lord still seems a bit like an oxymoron. Like, we don't know where to place that. And yet we see it throughout the scriptures and through time and time and time again, the humility with which the Lord responds and interacts with us. A ridiculous portrayal of humility. To the Romans, to even <laughs> common history, right? Kings seek power and glory. Kings and cultures of our world would seek glory in avoidance of humility. Yet Jesus shows us humility actually leads into glory. Jesus said in Luke 14, 11, for those who will exalt themselves will be humbled. Those who humble themselves will be exalted. Peter in 1 Peter 5 says, humble yourselves therefore under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. I think there again for Peter, he's, he's speaking from experience if we saw where Peter began in all of this with Jesus. Humility leads us into glory. Right? Humility is actually a part of glory. They're not two separate things. And this is really important because otherwise, if we read that passage and we just think, okay, if I humble myself, I'll be exalted later, then we, we try to play this reverse psychology game with God. I'm going to be really, really humble right now, so then I get a bunch of glory later on in life. Maybe I'm the only one, but right? Like, that's where our sinful nature takes it. But that's not, that's not what's being displayed here. It's not what Jesus displayed here. Humility is a part of glory. Through humility, we actually become glorious in God's sight. Remember Christ, right? That when he rose again, so he has a resurrected body, a glorified body, as the scriptures say, and he appears before his disciples, even in his glorification, even after being exalted, he's still bearing the scars on his wrists and on his ankles. And those didn't take away from his glory. They actually showed his glory all the more because of all that he did in his process of going there. And what do we see that after Christ, right, is glorified, what does he do with his glory? He shares it. Verse 11, first with the Father, <laughs> it says, and every tongue will acknowledge that Christ Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It was not a selfish ambition or vain, self-centered conceit. It was something that when he received, he gave back to the Father. And more than that, if you turn to Colossians 1, 3, and 4, he says, Paul here says, for you died to this life. Your real life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in his glory. So Christ shares his glory with the Father and he shares it with you and me. Man, back in verse 3, right, when we read, do nothing out of vain conceit, do nothing out of false glory or empty glory, Jesus shows us it's just a whole other way to operate. Right, where the Romans would operate, this was an operating force behind what they did for their own glory, for their own power, a glory which would not last. Jesus says, man, well, if we can actually come to the realization of giving up selfish glory for a life of humility, humility is actually the path, the journey into the glory with God, the glory that we don't deserve in and of ourselves, but that Jesus would share with us as we walk with him. So we can live a life of empty glory, self-made attempts at glory, or we can toss our glory to the wayside in exchange for glorious humility with and through Jesus. 
if you had to be sincere and honest with yourself, man, what, what kind of glory dominates your motives <laughs> in your day-to-day, in work, in the family, in the church? W- what are you seeking after? Which glory are you seeking? Worship team, if you want to come on up as we close. As we, as we do wrap up, I want to make sure that we ask the question behind the question here. We see this picture of crazy humility from God, right? And we see him lowering himself to the lowest of places in what he did. But the question behind the question is, why did Jesus humble himself to the lowest of places? What motivated his actions? This is church, so I hate to throw John 3.16 at you, but I'm going to. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. The motivation behind Jesus' humility and behind all that he did was his love for you and me. For all who would, in humility, accept his sacrifice and accept our need for him. Hebrews 12.2 says, Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and now he is seated in the place of honor beside, beside God's throne. Jesus endured the cross, taking no notice of the shame, disregarding it. Like it didn't even exist because in doing so, he brought you and me into glory with him. Because in doing so, bringing us into glory, this actually was a source of joy for him. Throughout this first chapter of Philippians, we've seen time and time again in place after place where the Christian finds joy. Here we see where God finds joy in redeeming you and me. That you are a source of joy for the Father and the Son and the Spirit. Zephaniah 3.17 For the Lord your God is living among you. He is a mighty Savior. He will take delight in you with gladness. With his love he will calm all of your fears. He will rejoice over you with joyful songs. Jesus went to the cross because of his love for you. He endured the cross because of his joy in you. And as we enter into this next song, take a moment and rest in that. Like let let the Spirit of God actually put that truth into your heart the love that the Father has for us, the joy that he has in us. God, we thank you. We thank you for your great humility. We thank you for all that you have done on our behalf. For your life and your death, your resurrection, your glorification. That we too can share now, Father, in your life, death, the resurrection, and glory. Father, I pray that you would speak again directly to where each of us need you to speak, Lord. That your sense of joy would be felt. That your great love for us would be known. So lead us in this time, Father. It's in your name.